So in this talk, I will um, try to explain why, as a cloud developers, we should care about distributed tracing. Uh, I will show uh, a demo of a CNCF project Jaeger, which is a distributed tracing system. Uh, and I'll speak about the challenges of actually rolling out distributed tracing in a large organization like Uber and some lessons that we've learned from that. Um, just as an introduction, why you should care about anything I say. Uh, so I've been doing tracing for about just two years. Uh, I work at Uber in New York um, <clears throat> on the observability team. Uh, I, I was a founder of Jaeger project uh, at Uber and also was a sort of a co-conspirator in the open tracing project when we started two years ago. And you can find me on GitHub and Twitter. Um, so this is a, a diagram uh, which Jaeger can present, which is about like sort of a snapshot of Uber architecture. Obviously, it's not everything, but uh, some of it. And, um, so uh, when you use Uber app or any ride-hailing uh, app, really, uh, every second the app communicates to the back end, right? And this communication might look like this. Uh, so instead of talking to just one single server, every request like spreads out across a uh, different number of microservices, potentially hitting hundreds of thousands even of individual service instances. Uh, <clears throat> and at least at our scale, that happens billions of times a day, right? So, Complex system, how do we monitor such a complex system to make sure that everything is working? Uh, well, how do we traditionally do this? We, we use metrics and login as the like, classic monitoring tools, right? With metrics, is a, like counters, stats, and gauges, etc. Uh, there are various techniques uh, of people telling you what you should be monitoring to kind of know whether your components are healthy or not. And there's various uh, products like StatsD, Prometheus, Grafana, which allow you to collect those metrics, visualize them. Um, similar story on logging. I'm talking about application events logging, um, and also like errors and stack traces. And so as well, there's an ecosystem of tools that allow you to um, grab all that data and sort of aggregate it and present. So do these tools actually uh, help? Well, of course, they help with certain cases. But um, the monitoring tools ultimately must tell us a story about what's going on in my system. So I was running a demo someone gave me yesterday, and uh, when I reloaded the web page, uh, I got this. The process just crashed. So um, how do we debug this? Uh, well, I don't know. Like the, the code in the, that demo didn't even use this uh, scanner class at all, right? And so yet it crashed with this message. So uh, and the. <laughs> It's very unusual for a program to crash like this because typically you get a stack trace in, in, in any program, right? And this one crashed without stack trace, which is surprising to me. Um, anyway, I didn't want to investigate it, but the point here is that uh, when we're talking about uh, microservices-based application, metrics and logs are essentially giving you this one line about one instance of a service somewhere, right? And how do you debug a problem without stack traces? So tracing, distributed tracing is essentially giving you what you can consider uh, distributed stack traces. What, what happens across all your services in the, micro, in the, in the architecture? Um, and so really, when we're trying to monitor architecture as complex as Uber, we want to monitor, monitor distributed transactions, not just individual instances. Um, and just before I do the demo, I just want to uh, give a basic idea of how distributed tracing works. So imagine we have a a service that requests come into our system. Um, and then when the request comes, what we do is we assign a unique ID to that request, simple thing. Uh, and we also introduce a notion of a context. And the context is something that we want to keep with this request, with this transaction, as it travels through the rest of the architecture. So if this service makes a call to another service, then we pass that context on, and so on. It makes more calls. We still pass that same context. Uh, and as we're doing this, we kind of now know, OK, this is the path that transaction took through the architecture. Uh, as long as we sort of can identify uh, all the instrumentation within those services by this unique ID that we assigned at the top, right? Um, you can modify context to, to also record some causality uh, information, like the fact that actually B called C and not just someone called C in this transaction, right? And so if we capture all that data in addition, it doesn't have to be in the context, but captured uh, in the background somewhere. Then we can build a trace, the timeline that you see on the right here. Um, so, and then uh, next thing, just before again, before the demo, just a quick introduction what Jaeger is a, is a distributed tracing uh, system we started at Uber. Um, and we open sourced it uh, a few months ago. Now it's an official CNCF project um, from September. 
and now I will show you uh, some demo of, of the tracing. So I will start with a kind of show you, uh, showing you an application that I want to uh, use for the demo. So this is a mock application, hot rod, it's like rides on demands. Uh, and uh, what you uh, can do with this one is you can pick a customer, you click a button and uh, the back, back end just goes and dispatches a car pretend car to you. And it gives you the license number. Uh, it also says when this car is arriving. And there is some, for our purposes, debugging information saying this is the unique request ID for that request to the backend. And this is how long it took to execute on the backend from the point of view of the, uh, of the front end. Right? So that's all I'm going to tell you about this application. Right? And so back to the point of monitoring tools should tell you the stories about the application. So what can I get about this application actually using tracing as a monitoring tool? Right? So I'll go to, uh, to the Jaeger front end. Let me reload it. Um, so the instrumentation in that application already sent some data to tracing backend. And so one thing I see here is that, oh, I suddenly got this uh, list of services that are pretend, apparently included in this application. Right. Uh, so, but let's not go there first. Let's go to this tab called dependency diagram. There's a separate view. So, purely by monitoring the interactions between the services, of course, with the instrumentation, uh, we got this diagram which actually tells us a lot about the application right away, right? We can kind of figure out what its architecture. We can see how many requests uh, go to which services. We can see that apparently there are two backend, database backends within this application. So, we haven't need to do, we didn't need to do anything uh, about like to get that, just to, to run the application. Um, so the second thing is, okay, well, this gives us the architecture, it doesn't give us the actual workflow, who calls whom, what the business logic within this application. So for that, uh, I can go and I, I search for traces. So there's one trace here at the top. Uh, notice it says 704 milliseconds. This is a bit lower than this one because there's a, this is from the client point of view, this is from the server point of view, so obviously it's shorter. Um, but when I click on the trace, so there are a lot of things on this, on this screen, uh, a lot of information. So most important one is you can see that this, uh, the time sequence diagram that I showed you on the previous slide is kind of now for the real service, right? And uh, these are individual operations executed by individual services listed on the left, and these are the operation names and how long they took. So one uh, thing that we can immediately say about the service is that, okay, well, this MySQL select operation takes almost 50% of the time. So if you we were trying to understand why your service in production is slow, just one look at the trace as, well, this is probably, well, at least a good place to investigate. Uh, what, what is it doing to for that long, right? Um, this, after all, it's all running on my local machine, how much is the <laughs> time you can spend on retrieving data from MySQL. What you can do as well is you can actually drill down into this and say, okay, well, these are, uh, this is the actual statement that was executed. So this is something that's automatically captured by tracing instrumentation. Um, and you can see that within this individual kind of span, right, a span is an operation within a, within a trace. So uh, further reach data, it also says that uh, there is a log statement here, acquiring log, blah, 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 whatever. We'll see why that um, is interesting later. Um, so Another thing we can see here is if I click at the top, this is kind of the entry level of the whole application, right? The, the so-called root span, uh, which spans the whole request. There are lots of logs here. And if we look at the logs, um, then if you read it all of it, you kind of can get an overall idea, not just uh, the architecture now, but what's the actual business flow within this application. Um, so like there is a... Uh, we, we were getting a customer, then we were finding the like, closest drivers, we were calculating the routes to each driver like this, and then finally we picked the best driver who is like, the closest or the shortest to reach the, the, the given point that we wanted. Um, and then we returned that data. So um, why am I showing this? Uh, you could clearly, you could get the same thing from the logs. Um, however, note that uh, these, all these applications could have been running on different instances potentially, right? And um, also, each application, if it was a production, then there would be 100 requests going through one single instance. So if you try to look at the logs, this, these 18 entries uh, are going to be mixed up with a gazillion of other entries from the same application, just from different threads. And how do you make sense of any of that? Well, tracing actually gives you just this, this transaction. It, it ignores everything else because it can correlate all the logs with this transaction ID uh, or the trace ID. Um, 
Um, and that's a very important, uh, basically, feature of the, of the tracing, is that it can give you highly contextualized information about all the things that your application is doing. Uh, and it also, like, again, uh, note that these logs are attached to this span because it's really this operation that was doing all these requests from the top level, right? The logs for MySQL operation were different because it was doing something else. So not only you get logs for a whole transaction, but you get logs parti like partitioned by individual uh, operations within that transaction. Um, so another thing that we can also figure out uh, quite easily from uh, this trace, if we're like, curious about what else could be the performance issue in this application. Right? Well, one thing is here. Uh, well, first of all, there are a couple of errors. Uh, like the red button here says there is an error. We can actually look at it. It was probably uh, like Redis timeout, right? So fine, uh, the service retries. Um, it increases the latency. But even if there are no errors, there's a very clear pattern, staircase pattern here, which indicates that, well, all these operations are done sequentially. And now, since we didn't write the application, we can't really say whether that's the right thing or not for the application. Well, I wrote it, so I do know that it's the wrong thing. It could have been like uh, fanning out all these requests in parallel, because all it did is just basically it loaded all the drivers first, and then getting some additional information for the driver. So use a thread pool, parallelize it. You could reduce this 180 milliseconds to probably what's the longest, like 10 milliseconds. So another source of latency right away, just by looking at the trace. I didn't have to do any sort of measurements anywhere additional. And the final one, so this one is interesting. By the way, there's a, I can actually do this, zoom in into this section. Um, so, um, so here we have uh, a whole bunch of requests to the root service. Um, and actually there are 10 of them because there are 10 drivers loaded. Uh, but the, the execution pattern is a bit strange. Like we see here that there is some parallelism, like three requests were starting to execute in parallel, but then uh, it's not three at a time. Actually, if you, if you look at the vertical lines, it's always three at a time because, well, simply there is a thread pool behind it with a size of three, and it's, uh, it limits how much work you can do on doing this particular operation. So this is not a problem in this specific trace, but um, if we were doing a lot of requests, and I can easily show you, like if, if I go here and let's say do this, right? Notice that the latency keeps climbing. So if I pick this one, uh, and actually, I can search the trace by individual tags. So this was a uh, driver ID. I think I can say driver. Should have tried it at home, but should work. Here it is. Um, so 1.6 seconds. Um, well, so now this MySQL is not just. Uh, uh, <laughs> it got even worse, right, with, with the load. Uh, obviously, MySQL server could have scaled easily. It's not a problem here because it's a simulated service, really. Um, but we can look at the, again, in the span and say, oh, you know what? I was actually lay, waiting on a log for other transactions. And notice uh, the interesting thing. It gives you the transaction IDs. Remember this transaction ID from here? Uh, so this service somehow knows this individual request. Like, we're looking at one trace one request, but it knows about other requests which will block in this particular request on a particular resource contention, right? So that information is actually hard to come by uh, if, if uh, without certain features that I'll, I'll dive in in a, in a second. Um, and yeah, so again, speaking of optimizing performance of this application, clearly this is one of the bad things. Like this, I, I was actually not able to show you the, uh, this, this impact on this thing like, because we need to solve the MySQL problem first, but if we solve it, to make it fast, uh, then this thing becomes a bottleneck because your thread pool of three obviously is blocking now a bunch of requests, so you can't even do three operations per, like in parallel for one transaction. You're going to be waiting on this contention. So um, <laughs> the whole point of that is like I, I'm just looking at one single trace about the application, and suddenly I know so much about performance uh, profile of this uh, whole application, and I'm not talking about one single service, right? That you could potentially could, could have done with some profiling tool, but I'm talking about the application as a distributed application with multiple microservices, um, which you could run as multiple instances. Um, so, um, one, one, one last thing uh, I want to demonstrate here is, um, so this application also emits metrics. Uh, and I have this, uh, this metric here, which is kind of interesting. So um, this metric says, this is a, uh, how much time we spent calculating the route by customer. Um, 
And what's interesting about it, well, it's like kind of easy to calculate, but the, the, the issue here is that if we look at the, uh, at the diagram here, right? So this is the, the root service. The root service actually doesn't know anything about the customer. Uh, it doesn't need to. It's, all it does is says like from point A to point B, what's the shortest route? Uh, and yet that service is able to provide a metric saying, oh, this is how much time I spent per customer, right? And that's another feature of distributed tracing, uh, which is known as distributed context propagation. Because, well, the front-end service does know the customer. And that front-end service can store the customer in the context. Remember the context I talked about at the beginning? Uh, if you store the customer in the context, then that context is available to every single node within your application. And then they can do additional statistic gathering based on that information, even though they don't really get that information in their direct API call or anything, uh, because they really don't care. Um, and that provides like very powerful features if you want to do cost attribution. Like at Google, uh, most of the requests, Google has very, also very deep stack. Uh, so if you have a, like a Gmail, eventually it might reach some storage like a big table. Uh, so the request actually carry the fact that this is a request coming from Gmail all the way to the storage, because then they can attribute that cost to something that makes sense for the business, right? So in this case, yeah, sure, I can attribute cost to, let's say, like the service that's calling me, that's easy. But really, we want to attribute the cost of uh, doing the work to some business concept that makes sense for our business. For example, if it was Uber, we could say, okay, this is a, a ride request like for the, for the sh ride sharing, or this is an Uber Eats delivery. Uh, so this is a high level business. And then we can say, okay, well, we are spending this many dollars per year uh, on this kind of business by doing this attribution, right? So it's a very powerful technique, um, and uh, I will, I'll speak about it in, in, a bit more. But um, this, is, this kind of DM application demonstrates how you can get it. And uh, just to prove you that I'm not lying about the fact that root service doesn't know anything about um, the uh, customer, we can go to the root service and we can look at the URL request that it gets. Uh, this is all it gets, right? It has just start, like, pick up and drop off point. Um, that's all it has, right? So how does it get the customer information? Well, customer information comes from the context. And co context is propagated automatically by tracing instrumentation transparently to the service. You don't need to change the API of the service or anything else. Imagine if you wanted to pass this data, like, for real, so that services actually know about it. You would have to go and change uh, like a lot of services and change their APIs. It's very expensive. Um, so let me stop here and, and go back to my uh, slides. And by the way, this demo, uh, there is a walkthrough if you're interested in, in this link. Uh, the slides will be shared afterwards. Um, so it goes in a lot more details about how you can actually troubleshoot these things using tracing. Um, and it, it, it has two aspects. It's like talks about open tracing and the Jaeger specifically, and, and really what you can do with that. Um, so to summarize, uh, one thing that, open, uh, that the tracing systems provide is the ability to monitor distributed transactions. The other thing is to do root cause analysis, right? So if you can find a trace which is looking suspicious, you can actually easily drill down into all various components that participated in that transaction and figure out what was going wrong. Uh, you can also do performance and latency optimizations using the same tool. And that's not just with individual traces. You can, if you build some uh, aggregation of the traces, then you can see patterns within the applications. And that's, I'll, uh, I'm going to be talking more about this. Um, and finally, service dependency analysis. So far, it was fairly simple, but um, like it's just a simple diagram. Um, I'll show you a, a more advanced version of it. And all of that functionality is fundamentally built on distributed context propagation. And this is something that I want to like, stress that um, context propagation in microservices is an extremely important concept. concept. Uh, many people are not doing this, and you will regret if you reach a certain maturity within the organization that you're not doing this. So it's easier to start from the, from the beginning to, to have it. So like, who likes tracing now, like after I've given this presentation, right? Um, so uh, quick poll, how many people here uh, actually in, the, in your company or organization have distributed tracing system deployed and in use? Uh, all right, it's a pretty good percentage, um, more than I expected. Um, so if the traciness was uh, so fun, as we saw before, how come um, it's not everyone raising their hands, right? And well, the question is kind of um, embarrassing a bit for, for the industry is that the instrumentation has been too hard so far uh, to do tracing. It's like uh, with login and metrics, it's easier. It's also work, but uh, with tracing, it's, it's a bit more work. And I want to explain why it's a bit more work. So imagine you have a service. 
Um, and it has like a server endpoint, and then there is a downstream call that you're making, right? And so uh, presumably uh, we add some instrumentation around these things to actually do the tracing uh, at, the, at the entry and exit points. Uh, and presumably some upstream server is already also instrumented and sending us the trace ID in the request headers, right? So what the very first thing we do in this application with the instrumentation really what it does, it says, okay, take the headers, extract the trace context, create a context object in memory. Um, that kind of, uh, you get that almost for free with the uh, standard frameworks today. Um, the second thing you need to do is like, as your application doing its work, you need to keep that context around so that if you do happen to make a downstream call, you can pass that context downstream, right? Because if you lose it, then the trace is broken. You can't follow the transaction anymore. So number two. And then the third one is when you actually do the make a call, uh, you take that context, the instrumentation encodes it again into the trace headers and passes on to the next request. And meanwhile, there's a, another library which kind of gets the callbacks from all this instrumentation and says, oh, I'm collecting tracing data. I'm going to submit it to the tracing backend somewhere for, for actual tracing aggregation. Um, so. Um, so this, uh, the, this uh, number two thing uh, is what's, what's known as in-process context propagation, different from distributed context uh, propagation. And uh, this is actually the, the thing that was preventing tracing from being wild ma mainstream these days, because uh, it's actually not straightforward to do. So it sort of depends on the language as well. So if you take languages which support thread locals, then uh, well, you can actually store the context in thread local and sort of get it in the next phase or like in the next layer of your application, let's say in the client, in the previous example. Um, and so it seems like it's, it's a happy case. You, you can do instrumentation almost without changing your application at all, right? Uh, it's almost a happy case except that there are we don't do software these days anymore like this, right? We, we, we don't write Java applications where request is processed by a single thread. Most applications now become asynchronous. They use queues inside that multi-threaded pools, etc. And so that actually complicates a lot this whole process of yeah, what seemed simpler with a thread local. Now it's not as simple. Um, there's another set of languages where thread local isn't even a thing, like in Go. Uh, you can't identify Go routine. Uh, and so what do you do in that case? Uh, well, you have to pass context explicitly, and uh, that's like a sad story here because uh, in many cases, um, it's, uh, if you didn't write your application from the start with passing the context, then, well, it's kind of too late, uh, or you have to rewrite a lot of API calls internally. Um, so it's not so happy. Um, I mean, fortunately, uh, in Go, the context object is a standard language function, like um, uh, object uh, class. So uh, Go language encourages you to use that all over the application. So hopefully, as a community, we'll start doing that. Uh, but it's actually, if you do do that, then tracing becomes almost easy. So like in, in, in at Uber, uh, tracing Go applications was actually not that hard because most people did know how to pass context around, right? And context exists for other purposes as well, like timeouts and, and cancellation and stuff. So it was already a mechanism which we can pick back on. Um, so is there zero trace instrumentation? Does it exist even as a concept? Um, so like I said, fundamentally, it's not even possible in some languages like Go. Um, but if you do pass context, then it kind of becomes almost easier, almost like almost free. Um, and then with the thread locals, as I said, it's, it's a double-edged sword. It's like you get some benefits. It's sometimes it's easy, but sometimes it's really hard, especially if you're working with a custom framework, which does some uh, custom asynchronous processing. Um, so uh, where at KubeCon, there's going to be uh, and have been already a lot of talks about service meshes, right? And so do they solve the problem, actually? Service meshes like Envoy, Linkerd, uh, they run as a sidecar. They take care of the, basically the business of doing RPC calls away from your application. So you can write your applications all kinds of languages, but sidecar does all the heavy logic of saying, like, I know how to route requests, how to do rate limiting, how to do load balancing, all these things, right? So very nice concept. Um, and they do monitoring as well. So they clearly can send metrics, but they can also do tracing for you. Like the example Lyft, like in, in Lyft, 95% of services don't do tracing. It all comes from, from Envoy, right? Um, and uh, the, the fine print, though, there is that to enable tracing, you just need to pass the header within the application. Uh, well, ironically, passing the header is the exact same problem of in-process context propagation, right? If you run in the situations with, again, the thread locals and multi-threaded, 
<laughs> it becomes the, the as, as challenging as, as otherwise. And so like open tracing as an API uh, now provides a primitives for doing uh, context propagation. And because open tracing API is being integrated into a lot of frameworks like Akka, which is like actor frameworks with very high uh, asynchronous, it can do the things for you without you changing the application. But if you write your custom thread pools, then you sort of have to do a bit of work for that. Uh, so now, um, what about uh, kind of what we learned at Uber from doing these things. Like, it actually felt like this guy. Uh, we have uh, by now close to 3,000 3, 3, microservices, and uh, about half of them are instrumented for tracing, and that half has been a percentage for like a year and a half, as far as I remember, even though the number of microservices keeps growing. So um, it, it's a tough, uh, and um, it doesn't help with the fact that, that we have like four languages at Uber, so it makes it even harder on, on my team to actually provide instrumentations for all the languages and frameworks and write the client libraries. Um, so, uh, but if you are going to do this in your organization, so what, what you should do, like one thing, well, I would strongly advise using open tracing because it actually uh, decouples you from the actual tracing system. If you don't like Jaeger, if you want to switch to commercial vendor, which does a lot of work potentially in Jaeger, then you don't need to change your applications. That open tracing instrumentation stays the same. You just flip the, uh, which tracer you use, right? Um, and obviously, uh, it's a just common good good programming practice, you, you should use infrastructure libraries in your organization which are shared across teams so that like, you don't reinvent the wheel in every service. And if you do that, then it becomes a bit easier to enable tracing because that's the only place you have, kind of have to go and instrument things. And a good thing is many of them are already instrumented with open tracing because it's an open source API. Um, and it's like still vendor independent. Uh, and one important thing is like don't make configurations for tracing, right? It should come enabled by default. Uh, you can have a configuration to disable it, but we, we made the mistake originally with our Python clients of like you, you actually had to go and enable, like put a Boolean flag in the config, and that just like was completely unnecessary friction to, to rolling this out. Um, Education is very important. Uh, distributed context propagation, I mean, Dapper came out, what, in 2008, uh, 10 years ago. Uh, the concept is still new to many developers, so um, definitely giving talks internally in the company and explaining why it's important and showing some use cases uh, helps. Um, so I was mentioning this, uh, the feature uh, where the customer ID was passed around. This is, in open tracing, it's called baggage uh, because it's something that you carry with the request. It's not the actual trace ID, but it, it's an additional key value pair. And um, so what uh, we use it for is um, several things at, at Uber. So one thing is uh, we have various sources of synthetic traffic at Uber. Let's say there's a black box system which keeps like pinning the APIs and saying, is my services working correctly, right? And there could be some performance testing or like capacity testing that uh, increase a lot of, like create a lot of loads on the services as well. So if you, um, if you cannot distinguish the traffic uh, by these sources, then, and you monitor your metrics, suddenly your metrics goes wild and your alerts start firing, all because someone ran a performance test somewhere else, like not even on your service potentially upstream, right? So that's bad. So uh, by using the baggage and propagating this sort of the, the type of traffic that's getting into your service, you can separate metrics using as a dimension. And then you put alerts on the real production metrics and you say, okay, well, test metrics, I'm not gonna fire alerts in the middle of the night. Um, and the similar thing is tenancy. This is what essentially the customer information is. You pass that around uh, and you can do a lot of uh, cost attribution using that. And chaos engineering is another aspect. Like uh, if we have 3,000 microservices and you do the chaos monkey approach, you're gonna like keep killing things forever and not find anything because there's just too many permutations of things that you can kill and, and figure out what affects the actual re reliability of the service. So uh, with, with tracing, you can actually do targeted uh, sort of chaos introductions into the architecture based on, like you're saying, okay, you know where the request is going. You can encode certain parameters saying, okay, well, when it gets to this point, just kill that point or like black hole it. Uh, and so if you pass that information in the baggage in the request, it reaches, and it's again transaction specific. So that's the important piece here, is that transaction specific. Um, um, uh, so one other thing is kind of useful. We measure the adoption and the trace quality. So we wrote a process which kind of looks at all the traces uh, coming from various applications and says, okay, well, does this actually trace look correct? Does the instrumentation make sense? And if it's not, uh, we sort of uh, erase certain things. Like, I don't know if you can see that, but this is like a dashboard you can get by service. It says, oh, these are all the metrics 
specifically for tracing quality. And these metrics, like this is good, but this is not so good. You can improve it, and this is how, right? So we ser service this information as part of like a standard, uh, like a quality metric for or a quality dashboard for a service uh, that every service gets. Um, Integration with other tools is supremely helpful for rolling out tracing because those tools are your additional sort of uh, people who can go and, 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 and harass other people to, to implement tracing um, instead of you doing this. So um, I'm running out of time, but like black box testing I, I mentioned uh, is, is like an external testing tool. But because it's a low traffic, you can actually force tracing and make sure that every request from the black box tool is actually traced. And then you get the trace ID and suddenly if something fails, you can raise an alert and say, oh, and by the way, this failed. Right? So as opposed to if you don't have that information, all you know is that this endpoint to your total API layer failed. With Trace, you can pinpoint some downstream service that's responsible. Um, developer Studio is kind of an ID for developers uh, to where we have there, where you can drag your position on the map, put a driver here, and simulate a trip, and all this fun. Uh, the, it captures all kinds of requests going on between the APIs, and it also does tracing. So again, very useful people can actually get used to using tracing. Um, I mean, I'm not a showman, oh, sorry, I'm not a um, salesperson, so this is sort of kind of obvious point, but tracing is a product, uh, you have to sell it, um, you have to show, show value to your customers, right? And I don't know what this graphics is about, really. Uh. <laughs> Um, and uh, finally, well, I can't really, unfortunately, go with a service dependency diagram. So I mentioned that this is a very powerful tool for actually understanding what your application is doing, right? Uh, or how the system is, is, is organized. And uh, so you can see there are a lot of questions like, is my service critical for overall request flow? What workflows, business workflows, my service is participating in, right? Um, will my service survive Halloween? The big thing for Uber, like Halloween is super high traffic for us, and then we always do this capacity planning to make sure we have enough capacity for service services and then, but you don't really know without tracing because just because our business number of trips increases by two times, does it mean your service needs two times capacity? It could be 10 times. It's like the factor is not clear actually. So with tracing, you can get that factor, right? And um, another thing here is like a sample uh, dependency diagram. Um, so the previous one, you remember, that was kind of a simple version because it just me measured pairwise connections between services. Uh, this one actually looks at the path. And so when we say uh, this um, dingo at the top left is calling core service shrimp, these are not real names, and it's calling service dog. So my question is, is dingo service actually dependent on the dog or not? No way to tell here, right? Uh, we have a tool which I will demo if you come to uh, like a Jaeger deep dive session later tomorrow, because um, uh, I'm running out of time. But uh, you can actually tell by, by this new tool where, you, where which services it depends like at any depth of, of the dependency, right? So that's the pairwise. Um, and finally, my closing thought is that monitoring traditionally has been a lot about firefighting. Like, oh, I measure if something, the fire alerts, I do something really. Tracing can do that as well. It can help you root cause and troubleshoot problems. But tracing also provides a very vast amount of data to do better than that, to do like fire prevention, to figure out what's your capacity constraints, how you should optimize the performance and which components in the architecture need to be optimized because they are the actual bottlenecks, et cetera. So, and improving reliability basically of the service. Um, so quick um, call out. So as I said, there is gonna be two more Actually, three more sessions on Jaeger specifically, uh, and we'll show some of the demos again there. Um, and there's also Open Tracing Salon. I highly recommend to attend that. There's going to be general discussion about tracing. Uh, I also highly recommend not missing Ben Siegelman's keynote about um, uh, tracing in, in meshes. That was, uh, don't know what it's about. Super interesting. Um, and finally, uh, if you have more, if you need more information, this is our website. Some ways to get in touch with us. Uh, the demo walkthrough, and it's an open source project, so all contributions are welcome. Thank you.